Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's really impossible to hear you guys. Hold on. Also, no one is. Okay, please respond to your, your present this evening. Uh, John Aiken? Here. Omari Davis? Here. Robert Dutka is excused. Alex Foster? Here. Carmela Ham is excused. Gerald Laporte? Here. John Lawrence? Here. Just on a Okay. Um, Robert Medden? Rebecca Meyer? Here. Katie Myers is excused. Mark Turnbull? Here. Andrew Wenschel? Here. And Dick Woodruff? Okay, we do have a clock. Dick, if you're speaking to us, we can't hear you. You've been muted. I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I can I can hear you guys when you speak loudly. Like I could hear Cynthia really well, but I didn't hear anything that Omari said. So if you could speak up a little bit, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for thanks for that. Um, okay. Well, that will that Simon's explanation of the, of the hearing. And welcome to the um, welcome on to the meeting. Um so We'll dive into this. Um, so effective, effective September 1st, 2022, new state legislation now requires certain county appointed commissions, including HLRB, to have an in-person forum this monthly business. HLRB hearings are provided in a hybrid environment, both in-person and stream online. Members of the public may attend or participate either virtually or in-person. Members of the board and members of the public joining us this evening. Today's meeting is available to stream via the county website, via the Microsoft Teams link, there's also a dial-in phone option for those who wish to use it. Board members, presenters, speakers lose internet connectivity during today's meeting. Please reconnect with us via phone. Please keep your device muted and your video turned off until you're all called on to speak. Public speakers not sponsoring items on the agenda. Pre-registration to speak online. Oops, sorry, pre-registration to speak online at this meeting was required. Speaker slips are available at the front of the room for those in-person speakers who wish, who wish to speak here. I'll call on you to speak after the presentation. Of the agenda item. Meeting chat is active for participants who need technical assistance only. It should not be used for discussion, public comment, questions, or by agenda items or requests for more information. All public comments must be shared verbally for a record during the public, sorry, during the assigned public testimony period. All voting will be done by, by roll call. And lastly, there's a public forum. Today's meeting will be recorded and posted to the county website. All information associated with today's meeting, whether written or spoken, is subject to freedom of requirements and with that we can uh, do the um do the minutes for february 2023 do you have any comments on the meeting agreements uh, uh hearing none i'll i'll move that we approve the, the february 2023 hrb uh meeting minutes and just one reminder too that with it being february just be, just be sure that you were here in february um if you weren't in february just this uh, thing Voting. We'll have March and April for you. Yeah. Second. Oh, second. So please respond yes if you um, support the draft minutes from February. Mr. Aiken? Yes. Mr. Davids? Yes. Ms. Foster? Yes. Mr. Laporte? Yes. Uh, Ms. Meyer? Yes, yes. Mr. Turnbull? FC. Mr. Wenschel? Yes. And Mr. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. 
Thanks, everybody. So with that, we'll move into the public hearing for um, for, for our COAs. And, and one item on the, on the consent agenda, is there anybody that would like to pull out the consent agenda? I would like to consent agenda. I ain't sure for on the board. Okay. Let me know. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The only question I had was the uh, drawings that we got showed an arched gate, mm -hmm. and it said that the design review committee approved a straight gate instead of what looked like the old drawing where he put it rather than the new design, which is what we're approving tonight. So. I think you need to make you need to make sure that what's approved is what was proposed, not what right. was rejected. So I was including in the packet for review the stamped plans, which had the stamped date on it. So you knew those were the approved plans, and then a photograph of what had been proposed because they don't have drawings for the the only it's retroactive approval. And so this um I'll I'll send, I'll share it. Um, Oh, wait, maybe I am, but this is now on the screen. Not even sharing, never mind. That's okay. Um, so. Um, so this is a photograph of the gate in situ, which is the flat topped gate that they are now applying for. That's the... Yes, this is what they would like I sent them the packet just for your review. I'd included the stamped plans that show the amendment. So this is where the fence was, and it has the location of the gate, and then the picture of what was stamped. So it was approved previously. Yes. They prefer the flat top. Yeah. Okay. DRC also does. Yeah. As long as people under, because I didn't understand that, and I thought that's what was being proposed. Not this one. Okay. Right. I, I will, next time I'll, I'll uh, add another note that says uh, approved plans. And so you know this is the, the, the previous COA set. Other than that, I have no objection. Oh, move that. Sorry about that. Yeah. I'll second that. All right. So please say yes if you support the fence amendment. Mr. Aiken? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Ms. Foster? Yes. Mr. Laporte? Yes. Ms. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Meyer? Yes. yes. Mr. Turnbull? Yes. Mr. Wenschel? Yes. And Mr. Woodrum? Yes. Mr. Benham. And see you sneak in. Are we voting for? Yes, you do. Were you here for any of the conversation? Okay, so you'll stay. Lauren is going to present this before we do that. Uh, Mr. Khan, will you join the meeting? Mr. Khan, if you're speaking, you are muted. Um, I'll let Lauren present the project. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is our first discussion agenda for a form based code project involving 2910 Columbia Pike. Um, for COA 23-06. 
Um, this we saw um, uh, this project uh, come last month um, when uh, you all approved a COA to um, change the windows into a foldable window in the existing window opening. But just as a reminder, this is the former Arlington Hardware Building, which is identified in the commercial form based code as a historic facade. Um, and um, the hardware store opened back in 1931, and it was operated by a family um, until it closed in 2004. Um, so the applicant uh, is proposing to install new signage for um, their business, um, and it uh, the proposal involves removing the existing horizontal sign and existing vertical blade sign from the previous business. Um, and now is proposing to put up a new horizontal sign measuring 150 inches by 60 inches. This will be installed above the main entrance and then below the vertical blade sign, it will feature uh, the building's address, um, which is 2910 and cursive lettering below, which will read uh, food redefined. Um, the new vertical blade sign will measure 22 inches by 120 inches. Um, and both will be installed into the historic facade um, so that you know the signs will have uh, will be illuminated LED channel let letters um, will involve a white acrylic face with black trim and black aluminum returns um, and um, the font of uh, the lettering and the numbers is um, supposed to be complementary to the building's simple design um, and um, they also have agreed to make any repairs uh, to the historic facade if there's any punctures that are being used, um, as well as um, if they need to uh, clean the historic facade once they remove the existing signs right now. Um, and if it seems like that's necessary, they've agreed to uh, be in contact with the historic preservation program so we can kind of provide some guidance on how to properly clean um, the historic facade. So the DRC saw this um, at their April 15th meeting um, and um, some of the things that were kind of brought up was the fact that um, the design was different than what you're seeing tonight and um, it was brought up uh, that um, it was a bit challenging to see some of the text um, or really kind of be able to read what was being uh, what was being put up on the signs and so it was kind of suggested to um, consider looking at maybe a different type of font so it could be a little bit more legible. Um, and it was also um, suggested that the um, to make the sign a little bit longer um, because the sign that the DRC saw was a bit shorter. Um, and so um, the applicant was uh, uh, receptive of these uh, changes. Um, or suggestions, um, as well as just kind of just reconfiguring the design pretty much all together. And so what you're seeing tonight is kind of new to everybody at the table, um, but it definitely with the staff recommendation, um, we felt that the um, overall design of the signs, you know, was consistent with signage that you'll find along um, Columbia Pike, um, as well as we felt that it followed the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, uh, specifically standard number 10, um, that basically it's an alteration that could easily be reversed without any adverse effect to the property. And the changes to the design of the sign is um, uh, definitely reflective of at least what we are interpreting it from the staff of what the DRC had made as a recommendation. Uh, so uh, that is the conclusion to the staff report. And I have the, the drawing of what the DRC reviewed at their meeting, if anyone wants to see the change in the design. Um, Mr. Khan, have you joined the call? Yeah, I sent him a reminder email, ago, but um, I'm just going to share the image of what he has submitted before, just so you can see how much he's worked to try to um, have this look more like. This case not here. Um, try that again. Um, he really wanted to make it look more like the image that is the the sign that is already on uh, the building, and so he tried to go with this more deco. There it is. Okay. 
So this is what he had originally presented, which as you can see is um, far less similar to the uh, P. Brennan's Irish bar sign. And Andy had some concerns about the legibility of the numbers and understanding what it was, whether it was a restaurant. And so since then, um, this is, Um, sorry, everyone being beaten. There you okay, so now you can see that this, and I have included the P. and Brennan's Irish pub, so you can see it has those two lines. And, and Robert Dunker said he, he quite liked that, like, uh, deco look. And um, I included the Arlington hardware sign, which also had those lines. And so the applicant has chosen to incorporate that into his. I mean, the yellow lines or which lines? Well, the two, uh, yes, the, just the fact that there are two parallel lines, he's chosen to incorporate that and he changed it to a black color, which I, I included another request. Um, because there was, he couldn't include, he couldn't reuse the strip, uh, the two lines at the bottom. He was asked if he could reuse that and it wasn't possible to reuse it. So he choose, chose to incorporate it in a new way in these two vertical, uh, horizontal lines. So in that respect, that second photo is a bit misleading. It's still a couple line side. Oh, well, this was just, you mean this one? Well, you go back to see the profile view of the street side. Oh, yes, because it's it hasn't yeah. been removed okay. yet because he won't remove it until we give him permission. And that leads to um, Rebecca had asked, what does the brick look like behind it? And he doesn't know yet. And that's why also one of the reasons he made the sign a bit bigger. I, for instance, keeping with the historic nature of it, and I may have misunderstood this at CRC, I thought that we were keeping the long horizontal with the white stripes, and especially seeing uh, the photo of it when it was the hardware store, seeing that same aesthetic, and it may not be the exact one with the replica. Um, I think I would prefer to see that stay out than the two horizontal yellow or orange stripes. Um, and then I think also having it be one line instead of two, because I think proportionally it starts to get busy and just deviates a lot more from the historic nature of it. I think, and I know part of this is uh, business preference of everything, but I think if the horizontal or the vertical sign had the spoon and fork, I think that would be a way to minimize the height and then to do 2910 food redefined all in one line, but but open to however they'd like to interpret it. I just would prefer to see it longer instead of taller. I agree with that. Um, you know, we I remember when we originally the design for P. Brennan's, they really made an effort to um, try to put it like it was when Arlington Hardware was there. And I, I think, you know, you got different titles, so maybe it doesn't fit in as well. But this to me doesn't evoke the design, the design of the Arlington Hardware sign at all. I mean, I, if you put it on a, you know, one, two, three, four, I, I don't think I checked it. I didn't, I picked this out as something that evokes that sign. It's it's so I mean the, the previous version was I mean I don't I don't think they even tried to evoke the sign. Okay. Now they're trying, but I think they need to try. And the the uh, vertical sign uh, I noticed the numbers don't seem to be in the middle. That kind of bothers me too. I don't know if that's just the drawing is incorrect, but uh, you know it doesn't Doesn't look like it's a good drawing. Okay. The spacing is not. The spacing even. is. Yeah. That's what you're. It's kind of very. Redefined. Oh, yeah. 
think in the previous version it was right down the center. Yeah. But, yeah. But, Comments, questions? I actually would agree with them having two parallel lines, which could very easily be done with the horizontal sign. They could be done in narrow or as the um, the applicant wanted to do, and either have none at the top or maybe just a very faint one. Um, they could also be done in and having two parallel lines that are close closer together than the, uh, the ones on the example be more appropriate. I, I agree with that too. I mean, the lines as well as maybe light hitter or this. It does seem to clash a bit um, and deviate quite a bit from my previous signage. Know that it's that's a huge problem that it, it's different from previous signage and it's going to be a different place, but um, probably. But just in terms of the, the elements of the um, Arlington hardware and that, that were also adopted by the previous restaurant, those could be incorporated. Just the two parallel lines on the bottom of the sign, or the sleeve, and on the top. Do you have any any comment on it? Yeah, um, I, I think I'd agree with those who are critical of it. I, I don't think that sign really respects the Art Deco look of the either the hardware sign or the Brennan sign. It's just sort of uh, kind of weird. Appreciate the length of the sign a little bit. But I wonder if they went far enough, I think, that kind of the linearity of the existing sign kind of emphasizes that Art Deco and it kind of fits with that vibe. This still feels like it's as long as it needs to be. And, and kind of like Rebecca said, it, it projects upwards instead of kind of streamlining it. I think even if the design can just kind of extend a little bit, and that, I guess that's kind of hard to do with 2910 to the extent of the name. But Graphically, kind of visually, personally. Yeah, I would. I would also add also to that the sort of the the, the forehead. Sorry, the exterior, the, exterior, the, um, the vertical sign a little bit too much as well. So again, sort of that maybe increasing the horizontality a little bit and the sort of the the height of it as well. Mr. Khan online by chance here. Mr. Khan, you haven't joined us, have you? Do we know um, so the P Brennan sign, the vertical is overall height um, seems like it would not leave room for a are they going back in with a shorter vertical based on the measurements? Mm -hmm. uh, no, he plans to literally just take something. the laminate out and put the new laminate in. So then, is the is the sign being lowered to where the bread is? It's like a there. At least like the bottom that under your spine appears to be like where the red portion is maybe. I guess I just wonder if scale applies if it fits as well as still questioning the proportions of it. So you're wondering, sorry, if um the the black blade sign you're talking about, yes. whether or not it will fit with the proportion of the facade channel sign? Uh, or are you I wondering the if the way that it's right now, which I personally am not a fan of with respect to the historic character of it, but I don't know that the 
blade and the five foot tall sign will fit on the facade. The oh, waist. Okay, okay, so it's yes, the the two next to each other. Okay. So is there fifteen feet of distance between the um, bottom of that red band and the top red? Left um, the the P. Brennan sign goes to the very top. I think for me, it's just another justification for why the sign needs to be more. It's like the P. Brennan's, maybe it's just the angle, it's almost to the. So it appears that it would be longer. Comments, questions? It is definitely. Um, and I do appreciate this one, though. That. Hello? Mr. Mr. Khan? Khan? Yes, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. I was on mute. I've been trying to say something and I not, none of you guys could hear me. So I have a uh, good evening. Um, I'm, I'm, I can hardly hear a couple of comments being made. So uh, the P Brennan, you guys keep talking about P Brennan. Uh, you guys really need to realize that that was the name of their restaurant. The name of my restaurant is literally just numbers. And the last meeting that I had with you guys, because of that, and I added those uh, two words on the bottom, which is basically food redefined, that was added because of the comment that was made. And the, the vertical sign, uh, the hardware, I'm not touching the hardware. It's only the plexiglass that's been removed from the, uh, from the vertical sign. So if if my restaurant's name is only numbers and I'm trying my best basically to make sure I meet the standard and I'm trying to add the, uh, some words so people can understand what kind of place this is. And for that reason, I added the word food and I added the word redefined. I'm just really confused. I'm like, what is there that is not meeting the standard? I'm like, the numbers, the font, everything is very simple. Yeah, so I guess um, I guess this um, portionally and, and graphically, a lot of the comments have been, have all been essentially that let's let's see let's see, let's see, let's see something more more horizontal and also less vertical. Just some question as, as to whether or not the sign fits, sort of, sort of given what, what's being shown here. Like, for instance, is, is there five feet between sort of the, the bottom of the current red band and, the, sorry, the, the bottom of the current red band and the bottom of, of, of the vertical sign? There's some worry that potentially as drawn, it doesn't fit as well. Um, so those are the sort of the, the two highlights of things. I mean, other things that have been said, but again, it, it's mostly been about Sort of horizontality of the um, of the of the, of the uh, proportions of, of the sign. Um, that, that's been the sort of the highlights of things. But you know, there are other there comments as well, obviously. Okay, I think so. Like, when comments were about the horizontal sign, not the vertical. Okay. Sign. That's correct. Okay, so so the horizontal is, sign is. If you guys look at the previous, uh, not not my design, but I'm talking about P. Brennan, they had the little black box going all the way under the channels. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that black box is basically the reason I added the parallel line on the bottom is to use that, uh, to have that line, because there was a comment that was made last time in the last meeting. Uh, because the box is getting removed. It's a very old design, uh, and uh, I'm not even honestly sure if the block box is still working or not, because it's 
place has been closed down for a while. So uh, because of that box, that, that is the reason I added that line. So it will sit at the same place where the box originally was. And the channels are going right above that. So I, I'm just really trying to understand what is it there that is not being right. Uh, so if if there's something, because the time is clicking and I'm, I'm like, I need to open this place on, in June and I'm, I understand there's the things that I need to do. So I don't want to do something again if if and then come back next month and then there's some issue again because I'm trying to open this place. It's taking way too long, sir. So I know that I have to follow some procedures, which I'm happily able to, I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to do it, but I need to find out what seems to be the issue because I cannot change the numbers. That's the name of my business. So if some, if there's wordings that I need to add, I'll, I'll be more than happy to add it. But if you guys are asking me to completely change the name of my restaurant, that's out of the question. Yeah, Mr. Khan, that's not it at all. I think that um, what we were discussing, and I hope you can hear me, is that if you yeah. notice the length of the Brennan's Irish Pub sign, it, it appears to be quite a bit longer than the one you're proposing. And so if you stretched yours out so it was longer and made that bottom line line that you have into two parallel lines separating separated by a little bit of space, um, I think that would help make it look more horizontal. We're not asking you to change anything about the name. It's just the this particular design element and the size of it. Okay, so this size of the sign is literally 50, uh, is 100, one second, let me open that up here. Uh, it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, 150 inches. So that's literally uh, 14 feet. So that is a little over 14 feet. That's a very long sign, man. It's not a small sign. If I, I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you guys ever been to that location. If, if anybody ever drove by that location. Anytime. So we, yes. Yeah, so we have literally close to, I think, by 18, a uh, little less than 18 feet right now. So my sign is r close to 15 feet. It's not a huge difference. I think Lauren wants to uh, chime in here real quick. Lauren? Hi. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm understanding what Mr. Khan is kind of, I'm, I'm understanding both sides of what's going on with the discussion, but I do find that it's going to, it feels like it would be rather challenging for Mr. Khan to elongate the sign much more since it is just, 2910, then you've got the graphic of the fork and the spoon, and then the food redefined. I, I'm having a hard time trying to see how this sign could get longer because the previous business was three words and could be that long. So I'm, I'm, I'm also trying to see how much longer he could make the sign to kind of make it feel like what we're comfortable with, what we remember of the previous business. Um, before I continue my thought, um, Ms. Horwitz, I'm very proud that you are exercising while you are in the meeting. I think you need to take your video off because this is being recorded. Please continue your exercises, but I think you should take off the video. Thank you. Um, so uh, one of the things I also just kind of want to point out is I apologize that my staff report didn't put it in there, but the signage is not a character defining feature of this building. And so there's something we have to keep in mind that businesses change and therefore names of businesses change. And I know we're not asking Mr. Khan to change the name of his business because that would not make sense. But I think it's the matter of, I think that the pub that was there before um, was able to take advantage of the Arlington hardware sign being very long. So I'm wondering if there's a way that we can kind of come up with some compromise instead where I think one of the things that is kind of reminiscent of the Arlington hardware sign are the kind of the silver, the two silver lines that are underneath 
um, on the horizontal sign above the entrance. And I'm wondering if there's a way that maybe we could ask Mr. Khan to consider that into the design of his sign. But I'm also having a hard time trying to understand how we are dictating his uh, the graphics that are going along with his business. And it's different than what was there before. Um, but I'm also thinking of the fact that with the historic facade with Columbia Pike, the commercial Columbia Pike, um, we're making sure that the historic facade is retained, is preserved, is taken care of well. And Mr. Khan has shown that he would do that um, with the way that the sign would be put up on the historic facade as well as cleaning it as well as fixing any punctures. So there's some kind of, I just wanna kind of bring that up with the discussion. And, yeah, I would like to add one last comment. Those two lines and the black uh, lights that you guys see for the P. Brennan, mm -hmm. there's no way possible for me to keep it because it's running all the way from, the, from point A to point B and that sign is way too long. So if I just keep it and remove the channels right above it and put down my sign, it will not fit properly. I don't think we're that, asking you to do that. I think what we're asking you to do is just take a look at that bottom yellow line, yellow orange line, and divide it into two lines, perhaps. It won't be exactly the same as the other. It doesn't have to be, but it will give the if a, a, a closer approximation to um, to two parallel lines. That's, I think that's one all. second. One second. I'm I'm looking at the bottom line. Can you repeat that comment? What do you what exactly you want me to look at? The bottom line. Bottom yellow I'm line. At, yes, it, I look. Make it into two lines separated by a space. Okay, so instead of one line, you guys want me to go ahead spread it into two lines. So we'll be have two lines on the bottom. And how about the top one? I don't know that anybody expressed comments about the top. I think Dick wanted to make a comment as well. Dick, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I don't want to prolong it, but you know, I think my understanding from Mr. Khan was that the proposal to add the language underneath the 2910 sign came after, came in response to a conversation at the DRC, if, if I'm not mistaken. But one way to increase the sort of horizontality of the sign would be to take that food redefined piece off. And that would um, give it a more horizontal look. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, I think for, so my sort of recommendation or idea for this is that um, I think it might be a good idea to, to defer this to, to the DRC next month, given where we are with things and, 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 and given the time and sort of everything else. And it's not my, the ideal way to sort of deal with this, but I think that that might be the best way to maybe keep things the ball sort of rolling and th th things otherwise. So. Um, as any sort of objections to that, we can make a big motion there. That's actually so. Actually, I'll I'll move to do that. If there are any objections or discuss those, I guess after after the motion is made. So I move that HRLB. Um, I move that HRLB defer uh, deferred um, deferred approval or denial. The blaze sign and facade sign for both 2910 Columbia Pike until further review by the DRC. And then because the DRC could put it on a consent agenda, so I guess. But, uh, but what exactly do I have to do? I'm, I'm, I'm confused. So do I have to, is there suggestions being made that I need to follow and reset it to you guys? What exactly I have to do for my end? Sure. You're right. I mean, we'll have the. We, we can we send them sort of con, sort of conditional meeting minutes, sort of sort of sort of listing. I guess what we what we discussed here tonight. Mr. Khan, staff can follow up with you tomorrow on on some yeah. next steps. 
so it's clear what's expected and then the board would want you to return to the design review committee next month with some refinements to the design but both but staff can can walk you through what was discussed tonight to help you prepare yes, for that. okay that's fine thank you so much guys can i make a suggestion um Please. i mean given his what Mr. Khan said about his time constraints and wanting to open the restaurant. If it's going to go back to the DRC, can the DRC just give conditional approval to it so he doesn't have to wait until the June meet or the May meeting of the HLRB? No, we can't do that. No. Uh, uh, procedurally, no. DRC could opt to put it on the consent agenda for the May, the May HLRB. Because guys, it's going to take a good four to six weeks, even with the county after you guys give us approval. So my time is really like I'm cutting extremely short. And it's just, I'm like, I understand there's a process that you guys have to follow and I got to follow it too. But uh, if I can just send you and follow all your recommendations and redo the, the design again and resend it to you guys, is there any way possible that we can have that done in the first meeting so I don't have to wait until the end of the month? Well, it seems to me that if he gets it put on the consent agenda, then he can at least get moving with the production of the sign. Why not? Because he wouldn't have a permit. So then we would have to do it the other way around, where we, where we would go to for a conditional approval pending DRC. Um, acceptance with the recommendation okay. rather than allowing because we cannot uh, give procedural power, um, particularly when there will not be support. Yeah. Yeah, let's, 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 at, least, let's at least do that, at least speed things up a little bit. I mean, sort of um, putting their ideas. You know. yeah, so the motion on the table, though, is to defer. Can you, did you type out? Did, did you catch that? that? Okay, what can you read back what was okay. suggested? What was originally suggested was I move that the HLRB defer approval or denial of the blade sign and facade sign proposed for 2910 Columbia Pike until further review by the DRC. Okay. We can amend that. So there was no second. No second or oh, okay. um, I'll second. Don't need a second. Yeah, let's revise that. Get ready. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. I moved that HLRB. Um, uh, let's see. Grant conditional approval to the blade sign and blade sign and facade sign proposed for 2020 of Pike pending uh, DRC review and. Um, I think they don't approve ice for DRC, DRC uh, recommendations. Yeah, DRC, so I guess DRC recommendations. DRC review and recommendations? Um, yes. Yeah. Approbation with the approval. Oh, same thing. Can't approve it though. So I guess I guess re so recommendations. Right. Recommendations, yeah. Because the RC can't approve it. So. Right. And I'll speed things up at least by okay. Does everyone understand the new motion? Okay. I just Bob mentioned, is this a package deal? Is it if we could approve conditionally the or not even conditionally, just just approve, approve to the vertical panel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just get started on that. And if something goes wrong later, God forbid, then he'll have at least signage up for opening day. Well, one of the suggestions was mm -hmm. to because the, the food redefined, from my understanding, it was put on there because DRC suggested it. So um I presume if it's on the other one, I'm not sure about that. If you prefer to I didn't hear any objections to that particular plan. Not on the vertical one, but I think it's up to him stylistically if he wants to have it on, if he wants to take it off both. I, I, I see what you're saying. Or 
there be any objection. When that, if we approve it with that on there, then we just, they decide to take it off the other one. Then the assignable match, so to speak, is a stylistic thing. Really, I don't think that that's in our purview. Can't we just conditionally approve anything within that existing signage change is appropriate? I mean, his building can do whatever he wants. He's not changing the actual sign. Just we could approve. It. We could approve it with or without approval. I don't think we need to get in the weeds. I, I think, I mean, I think we can, we can, can we approve sort of the, the vertical only? I mean, I guess we can. can. Well, if you're, if you're offering conditional approval, I think it's for the package as presented yes, that, through refinements that DRC is going to recommend. So I think you can, it can be covered um, under the current motion, but you don't have a second floor. The whole idea of, allow, of giving conditional approval is to give DRC the authority to work with the owner to come up with something that we think, based on the architect's expertise on the DRC, will work for the building. So can't we just have a very general motion that gives conditional approval pending DRC's approval of the design? That's what we have. That's what we have. Currently, yeah. We have right now. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's, let's vote. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to call the roll. So if you support the motion, please say yes, Mr. Aiken. Can you read the motion? Of course. One last time. Yep. Thank I you. Read that's that's, that's a good idea. Okay. I move that the HALRB grant conditional approval of the blade sign and facade sign proposed for 2910 Columbia Pike pending DRC review and recommendations. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Davis? Yes. Ms. Foster? Yes. Mr. Laporte? Yes. Ms. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Medden? Yes. Ms. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Turnbull? Mr. Mr. Wenschel? Yes. And Mr. Woodruff? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, okay. Uh, that, let's move on to 2408. Can I get to speak? Lawrence. Yes. Yeah. Laura, are you ready for number two? Honey, um, we have another sign uh, project that is being brought to the HLRB. So this is for uh, 2408 Columbia Pike, um, which is C0A, sorry, COA 23-05. Um, it's Columbia Pike form based code project. And um, this is also identified in the Columbia Pike commercial form phase code as a historic facade, just like uh, 2910 Columbia Pike. Um, this building was constructed in 1951, and the building has been part of many conversations that we've had um, in front of the HLRB, many that have involved some big redevelopment opportunities. Um, I don't know about what is happening with any of those. I wish I could answer those questions. I believe that ownership has changed, and so I don't think that the last redevelopment project that was presented to the HLRB back in 2020 um, is happening, um, but I'm not sure. Um, so, but right now what we're looking at is um, a sign project for a business that's going in right next to Rappahannock Coffee. Um, and they are proposing to, um, the, the business is called Thicker Clouds. Um, they are going to put um, a horizontal sign that's 16 feet uh, by 33 inches. Uh, they plan to install it above the building's canopy directly on the building, um, and it will consist of internally lighted channel letters along a raceway. Um, it will be, um, it will have five inch deep aluminum channels with black returns, and the sign letters will be red and white acrylic covered by vinyl, um, and um, there will also be um, LED lights on the side. Um, and all of the hardware will be galvanized and um, any penetrations that maybe are that are put into the wall or are not used will be sealed. So the DRC saw this project at its April 5th hybrid meeting and um, they made a suggestion what was presented to them. They made a suggestion that the sign be lifted up a bit higher. Um, some of the things that we were staff was concerned about as well as some of the DRC members was the placement of the sign. We want to try and keep it kind of consistent with the placement of the Rappahannock 
um, coffee sign um, right next door, as well as um, it almost looks like there is a, a different type of brick treatment happening on the historic facade, which is not the case. It's actually just paint. Um, and as you know, we do not dictate color, um, but we do want to kind of keep that um, that green brick or at least the different um, color of the brick to, I don't know why I differentiated, that's the same thing. Um, they want to be able to see at least the top um, one or two lines um, uh, right below the coping so that uh, this, the sign doesn't cover that up too much because it's part of kind of the design element that we've got going on here. Um, and then also uh, the side uh, signs um, uh, that are um, uh, LED, they were a really dark black and it was suggested that that be softened a bit um, and maybe use like a dark gray. And um, and those were most of the comments from the DRC. And um, staff recommendations, again, is to approve the subject application. We filled out the materials, the design, um, the way that the sign's going to be put up is all consistent with um, how a business on a historic facade would be able to put up its sign. Um, we also feel that it follows standard number 10 of the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehab, which is that basically any alteration can be easily reversed. And um, so that is really the end of the staff report. Um, Mr. Katari, uh, is there anything yes. you would like to add to uh, Ms. Farris's presentation? Um, not really. I mean, I, I mean, from the picture, you, you probably can't tell that the top of our sign matches the top of um, the top of Rappahannock sign. Uh, that's what one of the recommendation was. So, and we changed it, and now it matches it. And then, of course, we softened the the vape and smoke the background of that, which was really dark, and now it's like a grayish uh, shade. So, we made the changes as uh, recommended. And um, this red, uh, it looks super bright, but it's not like in actuality, it's not as bright as it looks in the picture. So, I don't know if that makes any difference. But that's about it. Thank you. Oh, um, that is a piece of electrical equipment. Um, I think it's on both. I think it's Mr. Pataria. The electrical element that's on the facade right now, is that um, a light? No, I, I think it's the, the one that exists right now, right? On top of the windows on the yes. ceiling. So that I think that's just an electrical outlet. I don't know if there's like a small box that's attached to it, but that's not part of our sign or anything. Previous sign was lit. Yeah. It's probably the wiring. Yeah, so it's it's not a light, no. I have a question. Um, somebody mentioned that we don't do color. I think that's true when you're talking about the colors of buildings, but when you're talking about signs, we definitely have done color in the past. I have a number on the, uh, it's considered a part of the design of the sign. Color is part, I mean, I remember on the Buckingham uh, signs, we talked about color and uh, on the, uh, the shoot yes. repair shop between the old post office and uh, Lion uh, Hall, we definitely, I mean, I, that was a huge yeah, that controversy. Was so I don't think it's true that we don't do color. And I frankly think that the color, uh, the reason why we designate, uh, why we wanted this, uh, you know, this building was built in 1951, it's really not an art modern building, okay? Um, but people liked it so much because it tries to mimic the art modern. That's why we wanted to, and it seems to be this, want to keep the same look that we use to maintain to keep this building on Columbia Pike. They need to work more to make the sign look like the Rappahannock coffee sign rather than it right now it just doesn't to me it doesn't fit in at all with his you know what we call the historic characters. It was I don't think this is a historic district is what we call it. It's just part of a development and we're treating it as a historic district because we like it's it. It's a historic design. facade. Historic facade, right? 
Um, because, because we want, we, we like the facade of the Batman and coffee and this kind of, in, including the sign. And this doesn't really, in my judgment, uh, go far enough in trying to replicate um, or advocate uh, both the Batman and coffee. I don't, it doesn't look like they hardly tried at all. But anyway, that's my opinion. Your comments, questions from the group? Go ahead. I'm a little confused. I remember someone said that the top is now the same as the hand. Does that mean the color is the same or they moved thicker clouds down? They moved it down. down. So if you see there, it's the top it. of the rubber hammock sign, okay. it's the bottom of the yellow band. They moved that. So that the top of this sign also hits the bottom of the yellow band. I see the wrap behind the corner. Sorry, we don't have a, a shot. With right. That. So it only extends to the second. That top 10. I still think it takes too much. Time. Yeah, I agree. With you. It is very jarring. Perhaps, I mean, I, I think, I really think color has to come into it. Um, a more subdued color, perhaps a blue in, in the, um, the design element um, would certainly be helpful. And that could also be the background for the, for the words as well. I don't think it's sensitive to the historic building. Is the previous image that was originally submitted? You said this is about it. Yeah. I'm curious. I want to see the dark. And also, Dick, do you think any comments, Dick? Uh, no, I'm I'm fine with it. Thank you. Um, this is uh, Mr. Katari. Can I can I add something? Yes. So <clears throat> I don't know if you have the image from the previous business that existed here. They had a very I mean they had like a, a gray and red sign, I believe, if I'm not wrong. Um, again, like this, I know this red looks super bright, it looks super funky, but that's not how it's going to pop up. Um, and again, like I know last time I was told that the color was not being dictated, so we went with this color. We just went with a lighter version of the dark black that, you know, you guys or the DRC thought was too harsh. Um, am I wrong? Like I thought the, the colors were not part of the, the decision making uh, for the sign for historic district. Does that speak on that? I mean, typically in local historic districts, which this is not quite the same apple to an apple comparison, in local historic districts, color is not typically considered in terms of painting. Right. Color, like whether it's siding or the color of brick or the color of a roof. Um, the A few of our members this evening have referenced other decisions that have come before this body in terms of historic commercial properties and signage related to those. And color has been discussed as an element of the signage design. So it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nuanced difference. But it has been discussed. And I, I believe what you're hearing this evening is that several of the commissioners feel that the colors used in the signage are part of the, the design elements, and that's why they're discussing color. OK. OK. So the, the, what I was saying earlier, I know uh, I think Serena or Lauren, you're trying to get the image from the last time. Um, the the sign that existed here before was cabinet era i don't know if you have that sign i think we sent it to you last time but uh, cabinet era used to be here um, 
on 124 way Columbia Pike. And they had like a dark gray and then some red, if I'm not wrong. Um, I don't have it in front of me. <clears throat> so it would be like that kind of a red uh, to match it. We're still trying to pull it up. Sure. Having, we're having technical delays tonight. <laughs> So I think, yeah, in, in this, like, I don't know if you, if you see the red background of the era, that probably would be the red that we're gonna use with the white and then the darker gray on the sides that we have shown. Oh, that's good. Okay. I, I recall seeing that as well. I, I um, now that I see the sign, um, I actually don't have this the issues with the color, um, but I do see what others are saying about it character of it, but it's not a great gift. You're supposed to get on. I'm not sure I have it. Your comments or questions right now? Finally, um, Yeah. Can I make a suggestion? I'm wondering if if we're talking about, so we're kind of looking at this sign, we're looking at the previous sign, they both had the same type of red, but this is a lot more red, and so it's a, li a little bit louder than what had been previously approved. So I'm wondering if, because this is so such a dominant color on this sign, if maybe we could make the suggestion um, for the applicant to maybe use a color that's a little bit more subdued um, so that it isn't as vibrant, but it's still visible because signage needs to be visible for businesses, for their customers to be able to see it. So I'm wondering if maybe we could have a suggestion of maybe a something a bit more subdued, like a burgundy or something, and that way it might work better with the whole character of the building as well as just existing signage next door so that it isn't so, so bold. And I'm wondering if that might be a solution. I think that would be a good solution. I had suggested blue was in the um, design element, but um, maybe the, if the applicant wants something um, that's more eye catching, then I think something in a very, very dark red would be. Yeah, I completely agree with that too. I think that would actually help a lot. Maybe. Maybe what we could suggest is similar to what we just did with the last application. Maybe it again, maybe just goes to the DRC as and it, it'd be a conditional COA where it is, you know, based on kind of a final review by the DRC and maybe the applicant can provide just a few different options somewhere where if they're comfortable with the idea of it being uh, more of like a burgundy red or maybe it's going back to maybe just the blue, kind of what the flame or the cloud or the smoke, whatever you want to call it. Um, maybe it's that and maybe the DRC can help work with the applicant on what might be a, a little bit more um, and, and sensitive to the design. That sounds like a good idea. I'll give you their motion and we can kind of go from there. Um, I guess we're based on that. Um, I move that the HLRB grant conditional approval to the side sign for 2408 Columbia Pike pending review recommendation of the DRC. I'll second that motion. That, um, all the okay, please say yes if you support the motion. Mr. motion Aiken. Mr. Aiken. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis. Ms. Foster? Yes. Mr. LaPorte? Yes. Ms. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Medis? Yes. Yes. 
Ms. Meyer? Mr. Turnbull? Oh. Mr. Wenschel? Yes. Mr. Woodruff? Yes. Uh, so can I ask a question now, I guess? Good question. Sure, go ahead. It sounds like we got the conditional approval. I'm just going to send them a, a few design changes, I guess, uh, making it dark burgundy. Um, would that give us the final approval or is there anything else we would have to do after this? So this, the staff will coordinate with you tomorrow on next steps, but basically you need to come to the DRC next month and they will give the final blessing. So that's on the first Wednesday, so it's uh, two weeks today. Um, two weeks, okay. But then the only thing we, you guys are recommending is to change the red to dark burgundy, right? Would that suffice? Um, we said either dark burgundy or maybe another, if you were comfortable with another alternative, um, one of the members mentioned maybe going with a blue. So my suggestion is maybe if you're comfortable with that change, providing maybe two, two options to the DRC so they can react. OK, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we're on to the preliminary hearing for, for COA for the, the uh, Friesland project. All right, let's get ready. OK, so. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Before we start, I wanted to include this historic image and the same the photograph in the modern day behind it, so you can see. Um, I've never seen that photo. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Where did you find that? Uh, a deep, young deep black. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Lauren, do you do you want to do the introduction? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so I know that we have um, our applicants here uh, uh, in the room, in your room, not in my room. That'd be weird. Um, so, but uh, I just want to give uh, just a brief overview from my staff report. I'm going to try and keep it short because I want to get uh, the HRLB as much discussion time as well as I know that um, Scott Maddies is there to provide uh, an overview of what the proposed design is. So as you know, this is the Reevesland property, property located at 400 North Manchester Street. Um, this property was constructed in circa 1900 and it is located in the Bluemont Park neighborhood. Uh, the property became a local historic district in 2004 and it also has a county held easement protecting the exterior that was recorded in 2018. Um, there have been many things that have happened since the property has been an LHD in 2004, and there have been many things that have had to happen with it being a county owned property to get to the point where we are. And so I hope everybody looked that over in my staff report. Um, but I think a key couple key things to know is that in um, 2017, um, there were some suggestions I believe from some community members uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, I thought it was possibly from Habitat itself, but it's I'm not 100% sure, but suggesting the idea of Habitat for Humanities in Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia, I'm just going to keep referencing them as Habitat, you know, approached the county and proposed a rehabilitation and adaptive reuse of the farmhouse as a group home for residents with developmental disabilities. And then in February 2020, the county and Habitat reached a non-binding agreement for the project with a signed letter of intent. I'm going to continue referencing that as the LOI. The LOI was a, it was signed and it well, a lot of stuff has happened since February 2022, and so we had some delays. Um, but um, the specific conditions of the LOI have to be um, met in order for the county to convey the property to Habitat. And I can give you kind of a summary of those, but one of them is uh, there needs to be, in order for the process to kind of continue moving forward, leading to conveyance of the property to Habitat, um, uh, the HLRB needs to provide a conditional COA um, at, and be comfortable with any changes that Habitat might be proposing to the historic farmhouse. And then eventually there needs to be a finalized COA, um, uh, basically to the point before um, conveyed the property. 
So that's one reason other than we want to make sure that any changes that might be being proposed to the historic farmhouse, obviously we want them to be done in good design, but it's specifically a requirement in order for Habitat to be able to receive conveyance. Um, and so uh, conversation has been happening since the fall of last year to kind of see how this might be able to work out. And, um, and so finally, we're kind of where we are, but the proposed design concepts include restoring the exterior of the farmhouse, modernizing and renovating the home's interior, constructing, a two, um, constructing two new historically compatible additions, and modifying some aspects of the grounds and landscaping. And so um, I would like to pause on describing many things with the proposal, but um, I do want to at least make sure that Scott and as well as the members in the room can introduce themselves. Um, and I, I think if anything, the design review committee, I do want to bring up that they have been um, trying to um, influence some of the design. They uh, came to the March and the April DRC meetings um, and they made some changes to it. And I'm sure Scott can kind of go into details on that. Um, and um, if, for the most part, uh, staff does recommend um, that uh, the project be approved for a conditional COA. Um, we have many reasons where we feel that it meets many of the Secretary of Interior standards. I'm very um, glad that um, Dick um, contacted me and mentioned that there was something that I had had in the staff report, which was a typo, um, and it's concerning um, our recommendation concerning the window replacements. Um, the applicant is um, proposing to replace uh, the wood windows um, with um, with newer windows, but it's not technically an in-kind um, uh, window replacement. And my recommendation is that they should have an in-kind replacement wood windows for wood windows. Um, so I don't want to really go much more into it, but I'm here throughout to answer any questions, and I'd like to have the project manager introduce themselves to um, the HLRB, but I understand that they're, yep, that makes sense, that's the order. So I'm going to stop talking and let the team describe their project. Thank you. Uh, is it, can everyone hear me from where I'm sitting? Uh, yes. Around the table. So hi everyone, I'm Mike Spots. I'm the Director of Real Estate Development for Habitat for Humanity of DC and Northern Virginia. Been, uh, Really want to thank county staff in particular. This is a complex project that touches on many county agencies, and they've done an amazing job in making sure that everyone is pulling in the same direction to help move this project forward. Um, so I really appreciate the county staff support and the board's um, consideration of this proposal today. I um, also want to acknowledge and thank uh, Chris here, who's representing the Civic Association Boulevard Manor. Um, they have uh, been very supportive of the project, and, and we appreciate that support moving forward. Um, I want to reserve most of the time for Scott to talk about bricks and sticks, so to speak. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the project team and sort of the intended use of the property, because that guides and very much influences the design. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge our other team members that are either in the room or on the call. Uh, we have uh, Kristen Burr from Home Aid of the National Capital Region. Uh, Home Aid's a core partner in this project. They're going to be the construction lead. They're going to be doing the work. And what, what their overall mission is to uh, help work with uh, through relationships in the builder sector to create housing for those that have some of the highest barriers to housing in the region. So they've been a great partner throughout and they'll be partnering with us on the construction of this project. Um, and then uh, I also want to talk a little bit about of Greater Washington. They, I'm sure in the Q&A, they'll have an opportunity to introduce themselves as well to you. Uh, but Larsh uh, provides housing for adults with intellectual disabilities. They live, um, they're referred to as core members, and they core, the core members live in homes with uh, Larsh staff who really, they live as a family. And the family, it's its like having another, uh, just like any other neighbor in your neighborhood. They work to engage with the community, engage with the neighbor as you would with your own neighbors. And I've had the pleasure of visiting one of their homes, in existing homes in Arlington along Columbia Pike. Um, and, and it's really uh, an inspiring model of housing uh, for 
for individuals and persons with disabilities. So um, that guided a lot of the design elements that have gone into how we um, blend the um, how, how we blend the historic, how we service this bridge between the history of the property with its what its future is going to be, and how we can create uh, uh, an opportunity for new neighbors uh, and, and to meet a very critical housing need in Arlington County. Um, so, without further ado, um, I'd like to also introduce uh, Scott Maddies. Um, he has been our amazing uh, architect for this project. And I'll quit rambling so that he can talk about what you all are most interested in, which is the historic design of the property. Thank you. Is that okay? Am I on? Yes. 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 And then your, your presentation should be keyed up. So you can... Thank you very much. It's like hiding in the corner over there. It's the moment. Hiding from you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. I am I'm Scott Maddox uh, with Winsack and Associates Architect. And we're small, uh, district based, but small um, architecture design firm. I'm an Arlingtonian as well, uh, only for 28 years, so just still a newbie. <laughs> that again. Um, but I've been uh, attached to this since before the pandemic, and it's been a real pleasure. So I'm going to. So relatively quickly, I hope you've had a chance to look through the presentation in, in the uh, in the staff report. Always happy to circle back and answer questions. Uh, I'm going to skip over a lot of the summary historic stuff and kind of get to the proposal to the, in the interest of time. But just to point out on this slide, there is a URD on the property, and you can see the, the sort of the cross hatched area to the rear was the area allocated for a potential addition. Um, we're taking every inch of that in our proposal. Serve the program uh, and, and serve the large uh, program that we need every inch of that. So that I just want to highlight that. If we, uh, this is straight out of the Milner report. Um, it uh, designates the, the historic evolution of the property. Um, this the downside is I have to remind myself when you're not sitting at your computer and it's projected, sometimes the colors don't come out. So this is. Uh, Looking at all the uh, historic interiors with kind of color coded uh, to the to the same historic evolution. Let me skip through this. Our site plan. Um, so, a couple things. Here's the existing farmhouse. The addition we're proposing again is to the rear of that, and as I mentioned, we're taking every inch allowed in the URD. We did add a couple of these uh, green rectangles. Uh, just as a kind of a placeholder as we begin to develop site design with, with the civil engineer that will be on board, looking at opportunities where we may need some stormwater management opportunities on site. These would be very low scale, not, not structures per se, but part of the landscape. So here's the primary proposal. On the left is the existing, right is the proposed, and we've kind of grayed out the right on the right for distinction. We're proposing, I, I've always thought of it as one addition. I guess you can think of it as two, two additions interconnected. A two story addition here that comes directly off the back of what is the oldest portion, uh, the, what's known as the Torreson Tenant House, uh, straight back. And that's two stories for a portion of it sloping down to this primary one story addition. Um, I guess that heads east. Um, and it kind of helps create. An arrival court. Uh, this is generally the location of the existing paved area. We, we are proposing to modify that uh, somewhat in order to provide uh, a couple additional parking spaces with the launch program function. Uh, but it's a, a small two story addition and a, a bit larger one story addition. Uh, we have, so this you know, gives you the ground uh, again, the existing and the proposed. The shape of this addition here as it comes off the rear, you know, we really kind of actually like the proportion of this. It's asymmetric. It's got this kind of carve out where that existing porch is, um, the covered porch. Uh, we're essentially extruding that back. And in the detail of the siding that we're proposing, we want to give some deference to that, to that uh, historic porch. 
Um, and get a, you know, just a kind of a ghosted image of that, so to speak. So you're seeing the two story addition here. This is the existing, what was at one time an open porch became a kind of a closed in porch at some, at some point, um, not condition space currently, but we'll plan is to convert that to condition uses. Um, so that's from the, the neighborhood side, the community garden is sort of over here. This is from the drive aisle up. Uh, this again is sort of the motor court that exists, the, the parking pad, front porch. Here's our one story addition. It's a bit higher, uh, the eave line. So there is a bit of a distinction there. We think it's, it's positive. We've added some dormers to that. A one story addition to give it a little bit of uh, a little bit more texture to it. So it's uh, more visual interest. Uh, there is a, a one store, a proposed uh, shed dormer on the existing farmhouse. I'll show you that on the interior. But what we're planning to do is take the uh, existing stair hall that's about right here and create a, a more open two story stair hall and then extend that up to the third floor, really the attic, the current attic. That will be used for purely administrative functions, not for residents, but we need a little bit of headroom there at the, the top of the stair to get that. Um, we have this uh, roof shape here on the addition, kind of follows the, the pattern that exists in this facade with a closed pediment here. Um, and then we talked about three ramp options with the DRC. So we need a ramp. We need handicap accessibility. Handicap accessibility is a very important component of the program to serve the residents. We are proposing an, uh, an elevator here that connects uh, floor one and two. This is in the addition. So the back wall of the, the existing is here. So this is really the only position that works for an elevator, and that's in, in large measure why we have the two story addition to the rear. Um, because of the nature of the of headroom, uh, et cetera, that's really the only place it works. It really doesn't work anywhere within the footprint of the existing, uh, but um, we need an accessible entrance from grade. So we looked at three ramp options. The first ramp option was, is this, as you can see, this U-shape. And the, the rationale there is that we were looking for a solution that maintained the three existing stairs down to grade that exist, uh, undisturbed or stored. Um, the, the ramp comes in at the sort of the center line of one of the bays, the structural bays, so to speak, of the porch. Um, we are uh, proposing in all these scenarios to add railings that don't exist today, and that's in part not necessarily so much for a straight code requirement uh, because of the height of the porch, but really for the safety of residents. Many of them are either using walkers or wheelchairs and pulling off even a, a 12 inch rise is a problem. So this is a, a really important uh, safety feature for residents. So that was the first option. Feedback we got um, some positive, some negative feedback from the DRC. We looked at a second option, and this I'll say is the favorite option um, for, for, the, for the large program, is to have an L-shaped ramp uh, that uh, provides the most direct access. I'm not gonna zoom in because I might mess it up, but if you can see this uh, key plan below, this is the most convenient access from the handicapped parking to the ramp and, there, sorry, and therefore to the front porch. Um, this is the one that's favored by, by Larsh. Um, there, we got some feedback from the DRC. The downs one downside of this is that we feel like we need to close off this existing stair down just because it conflicts uh, that and place that with rail. Uh, at the last DRC, it was suggested to look at this option, which is a straight run ramp along the edge of the house. As you can see here, hopefully, in uh, passing. Um, which is sort of minimized in terms of its relationship to the porch, but it, I think uh, looking at it operationally, it seems a bit more problematic in that it's the furthest of these solutions. It's the furthest from the, from the handicap parking. It provides you know, the longest path for a resident to get from a, a parking space um, or just down to grade. It doesn't have to be to and from a parking space. It can be getting from the porch down in a handicap accessible method. Um, it seems to be the longest run and therefore the least favored. It also does require kind of extending the porch to 
to get a, a landing at the top and a platform. So that stair that exists here now today would have to. Um, those were the three options we looked at and discussed. Um, the the interior, just to highlight this very briefly, just to give you a sense of what's going on. So there will be uh, interior renovation in the existing farmhouse, and it'll be as as um, Mike had mentioned, it's a it's a big single family home for a family, different kind of a family, but it's a it's a family nonetheless. So that's kitchen, dining room, living room, social rooms on in the existing. The ground floor, the rear addition is a bedroom. There are five bedrooms and two big handicap accessible bathrooms. On the second floor, and here's that stair hall that we're we're creating a, a more open connective stair hall that, that goes all the way up. Here's the, the, in the second floor of the addition, the elevator coming up to a landing. There's a, a couple multi-purpose kinds of rooms up here and one bedroom uh, here to the rear. Um, and then in the attic of the one story addition of the. Anybody who lives in a, in a house or an apartment knows that storage is important, so we're, we're providing as much. Um, and then lastly, here's where it terminates at the top in the attic. This is this dashed line. If you can see it is where that former is proposed. And it's at the top of the stair and we just you just run out of headroom. Of that. As, as was mentioned, this is only administrative function for large staff. It's not for residents. So this series of if you were able to kind of read through all this and, and Lauren's report highlight some of this as well um, is a is the beginning of a restoration mission plan in terms of materiality and what our approach will be in, in very high level summary you know again it's restore the exterior of the, the existing farmhouse there's aluminum siding on it we're going to take it off and see what we got we don't know for sure what we've got you know, condition of it but the plan will be to restore it um, if that means um, Remove a bunch of rotted material and replace it in kind with wood siding of the same profile. That's what our plan is. Um, we just don't know how much that will be. Um, the windows. Um, part of the, the rationale for for window replacement is that uh, historic windows uh, operationally they're often a problem. They're hard to operate and they're not energy efficient. For both reasons, we we feel like long-term maintenance and for the ability to use them we want to replace their existing we had proposed aluminum clad wood windows in large measure again for a maintenance long-term maintenance issue they will not need to be painted over time those would need to be painted over time potentially proposes a, or presents a, a maintenance issue for operations over the addition is will be siding. It'll be you know neo traditional in character, but it will be of modern material, fiber cement siding, and easy trim. The same kind of windows. Those would certainly be aluminum clad wood windows, not not straight wood windows. Uh, if we go that way on the restoration, um, asphalt shingle, dimensional asphalt shingle, uh, roofing throughout. I don't know if there's much more of a highlight, there's probably more time than I was allotted anyway, so I just open it up for questions. I'm sure there's questions. We have a public speaker. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yep. Oh, you, you yeah. kind of. I, I signed up to speak. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, you know, uh, I hope everybody can hear me too. Um, <clears throat> you know, good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Tig, and I am the uh, I was the president of Boulevard Manor Civic Association. Yes. Uh, where the farmhouse is located uh, from 2017 to 2021. And I'm currently a board member. Uh, in April of 2017, I specifically raised this idea to now County Board Chairman Christian Dorsey after the county stated they would examine selling the property. Within days, myself, Habitat, and Chairman Dorsey held a brainstorming session around ideas. After pretty much six years to date, you have the sort of the final draft. Uh, since 2017, we engaged heavily with BMCA residents. 
Uh, I'm proud to say that I've yet to hear of any logical, rational reason why this, this project should not happen. You uh, have an opportunity to make history tonight. You have a distinct honor of creating a gold standard process of how community, free nonprofits, developers work hand in hand to adaptively reuse historical structures while still maintaining history, a sense of community, using no taxpayer funds, and most importantly, providing livable spaces for the least among us. This, this project uh, truly is missing the lease uh, among us housing. Envisioning such great examples as Trenton, New Jersey's Wilming Lofts, Michigan's Central Station, my personal favorite, Storm King Art Center in Cornwall, New York, uh, we, can, we together can create something unique, something special, make Arlington history and polish up the gem of our community. We have, a, we have an all-star leadership team that I'm humbled I'm honored to be a part of EMCA, Larch, uh, Habitat, and Homemade. Uh, we meet at least once every other week to work to resolve issues, plan, coordinate comms, and bring in others as needed. We are hand to hand in this together. We're fully committed to the success of this project. I look forward to bringing this to fruition. Thanks so much. Mike, did you want to introduce anyone else? So, um, I, I just want to, you know, we, they'll, I'm sure you'll have questions from them and hopefully they'll have an opportunity to uh, talk more. But Luke and Sarah from Larsh, if you want to just, uh, if, if there's anything about what I said in the intro about Larsh that I left out that you would like to, to raise now. Um, we love being part of Arlington as a community and um, it's a real gift to be able to consider that. This is an affirmation of people of intellectual disability in our community. We're doing this because of the county saying it's here. So when I told people it was a birthday party this evening, they were confused. But well, you need to go and do this. This is gonna enable more people to celebrate more birthdays in our community. I work um kind of on the side where communications and development, and we get so many calls of well, specifically in Arlington, wanting a home for their loved one. There is such a need for more housing for people with disabilities. And this will only be a drop in the bucket of that need, but it's a really important one. And um, yeah, we're really excited and um, so humbled to be a part of this team as well. It's just a really neat to see nonprofits working with each other, for each other, um, in the community right alongside us. And really excited to be here. That's before the board. Comments, questions, or comments? Quick question on the roof, which is metal. The existing now? Yeah. There's a little bit, the, uh, this little porch, porch. Is, okay. is metal. It's a red metal. Um, and then, good image of it. But there, if you remember, there's this little dormer on the existing kind of off picture here. That little shed dormer on that. Standing seam or uh, I, it's either standing or a flat seam. It's definitely a seam. Not shingles. I'll say something. I've been involved in, not with the current project, but with this project. But I was I can't tell you how many hours I've personally spent active in a previous nonprofit that tried to read it. But uh, I couldn't imagine a happier outcome than what it is. may happen. And uh, I've been a uh, minor of Arsh, Arsh from the 1960s. And I'm like, first heard Jean Bonnier speak up in Ottawa, Ontario, back in the maybe early 1970s. Um, you guys, you guys did great work. You have presented already, and very grateful that you might be able to 
expand that process project. And um, this may be a bit iconoclastic, and I don't think this will, it's going to set a precedent, but I'm fine with the land window in a historic park. Um, good aluminum clad windows, you can't tell the difference between aluminum clad and wood windows. I think it's, uh, it's going to help you with maintenance and uh, help this project along. I think that uh, I, I would be, I, I would vote in favor of that. Maybe <laughs> an anathema to the committee. I know we've had these discussions before. That, that is, in the past, at least, has been definitely. I think in terms of the uh, the addition and the massing, I think it's going to work. There, obviously, what you have to do inside drives to a large extent how big the addition has to be, and you're dealing with people who have specific needs for equipment um, and skimp on skimp. But I, I think you've done it in a big way. I would just say we have been looking for an answer to this for years. This is a very sensitively done, excellent use of the property. I think better than the prospect of single family. I do have a question for our staff. When we partition the property, make it available for sale. There's that other outbuildings. I forget what it used to be. The build shed. The build shed. Yeah. Yeah. It was the same the dairy and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. What is the structural condition of that building? Because that was, I seem to recall, a slight question when that came up before, and this was so many people living there who might be vulnerable, one that just don't want that to be a safety issue. That's a great question. So that that is part of the local historic district boundary. It is not part of the parcel that is going to be conveyed. That outbuilding will still be county owned. Um, condition assessment probably still is questionable. Um, so that is something that I think our staff would need to further coordinate with not only Department of Parks and Rec staff, but also with county leadership to kind of determine next steps for the milk shed. Um, but that is not part of the current. Right, I'm just more being aware of this would be a lot of residents nearby, not knowing what. But you happening. raise an excellent yeah. point. Mark. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good point. It, it's currently fenced off. Um, so it is inaccessible to any residents um, current that are there now that you know, there's a lot of uh, foot traffic through the site right. right now as it is. So so at present, it is currently fenced off. And we can't speak to the existing structural condition. Okay. Thank you. 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 Did you call on me, Omari? Yeah, yeah. There you go. There oh, you go. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'll just reiterate the comments of some of my colleagues. Uh, you know, the county has worked for a long time to find an, an appropriate uh, use for this historic building. And this looks like a really, really commendable solution. And I want to compliment Habitat and Homemade and the other sponsors for putting together such a really good project. Um, and a really worthy project, uh, and it'll, it'll be put to a really good use. I do want to say something about the windows, though. Um, properly painted, um, good quality wooden windows last as long and are as maintenance free as aluminum clad windows. And if we're going to hold um, homeowners in Arlington historic districts to the standard, the secretary's standards that require replacement with wooden windows. I think we need to be consistent on this project. Um, I don't see any reason why we would uh, want to allow uh, aluminum clad windows in, in, in this historic building. Uh, the addition is, is one thing, but the historic building, sight lines, dimensions, lights, um, all of those um, specifications need to be maintained and um, and so, you know, that, I think that's something we need to to hold you uh, to wooden windows. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. But but having said that, uh, it's a fantastic project, and commend you greatly for putting it together. Question about the uh, the windows. Um, uh, 
option is heard by the by the uh the judge. Have you thought about, thought about uh, keeping their case on sort of like the um case south side there for like keep, keep for like this yeah, 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 yeah. I think that right. like keeping part of part of it really or or all of it. Sure. I mean I think when we talked at DRC we it was still there and we talked about yeah. the, you know, sort of the conflict of using it with that that extent leg of the ramp kind of right. obstructing it. Um, we took it out and, and put a rail there. I, I think it's problematic to leave the stairs there at all. Could be a little area to sit down, tie your shoes or something yeah. like that. And that's fine. I, I don't think we have any problem. And end user perspective, we are okay with that. I think that would be a good yeah, I think when, on the ramp issue, I think sort of given our discussion previously, sort of seeing everything out. I mean, I think my personal personal preference would be for this um, option here. Any comments, questions from the group? That um, that so th so this will be this will be sort of the, the preliminary for for our first. COA essentially. So we'll be coming back to us at a later date with additional updates and everything else. So so this will be sort of a sort of a run one, but I, 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 I want to sort of echo everybody else and say that sort of this sort of this sort of first pass, initial pass is it's, it's a really, really great project. And I think we're all, all excited about it. Happy to see it before the board here. So with that, I'll make a motion. Uh, so I move the ATLR be approved conditional COA for Riesland LHD. At 400 North Manchester Street, pursuant to their return for a full COA approval when their plans are further established. Second that. <laughs> no. Dick, go ahead. Dick, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'd just like to have some understanding about some of the views of the other members of the board on the window issue before we. Go to a vote. Echo uh, what you said. Uh, I think uh, we pushed um, windows in terms of replacement. Wood windows. Yes. The insulated glazing are superior to anything that. Those historic windows maintain close appearance. And there are wood window replacements with the exhibit in the town. Maybe we can have them here. Shovel that they're cheaper, they're not cheap. And last for quite a while, it's been so long. Wood species. I don't think. I think there are paint coatings that work a lot better than oil based paints. I think that trouble. Even though I did it for a long time, the parts of this story is a major problem in terms of history. Trapping moisture to be able to blister it. Maybe. So I, I, I think it's common. We, we went through this a lot. I think we're the historic district in terms of what we're looking for. And, and I think we followed Alexandria's lead in saying that we would get away from. We have a system of wood windows that are failing and we single pane non insulated glazing. So uh, I think one of these replacement windows work really well. Is that enough, Dick? 
I can just make a general comment, and this does apply to the window conversation, but it, it's, um, I know this conditional, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the material discussions will not occur today, or the decisions will not occur today. It'll be during, when we proceed towards final COA and come back perhaps a couple, a few times, more than most likely, uh, as we get through different phases of design. But one of the things that I just want to just offer as a consideration as you're thinking and contemplating um, what the requirements might be in terms of materiality is the um, the cost is there is I do I understand what what you're saying regarding sort of requiring it of private homes um, as well as this but the the one difference in that is the a private home that makes an investment in their property can recoup that investment through appreciation of the value of that home this is going to be permanent a permanent home so any we we want to in that there's not going to be sort of any sort of economic um, you know, opportunity to uh, capture that appreciation over time. Uh, this is going to be permanent. It'll be permanently affordable. Um, and so that we have to look at, as we think about cost differentials, just in gen globally speaking, we have to think about the long-term cost of operating and replacement. Now, obviously, we want to focus on quality and durability uh, within the context of this historic design. Uh, the second element as it, can, as it pertains to materials is availability and the um, avail availability of the product and availability of the um, contractors that are able to install in a timely manner. So if this is a private home, you have, say, a, a branch falls through a window or through a roof, um, you can, you know, it's a, it's a hassle for any family, but you can move into another part house, you can potentially stay in an extended stay hotel for a period of time while you work through the process and getting it rebuilt. Um, that is a less of an option given the programming and the use of and uh, use of the property and, and who's going to be living there and some of the um, accessibility challenges that those households face. So the ability to, um, in the event that, a, this is less about, this comment's less about sort of routine maintenance that you can plan for and plan but for that unexpected maintenance that will occur in any property, um, if there is something that at, you know you might not be able to get a replacement, um, you add maybe four, three, three, four months or three, four weeks, three, four months, whatever your time period is to get a replacement installed, uh, sourced and installed, that can create a material hardship for them. So, um, you know, we obviously can do our research on which materials. Um, that might apply to in which it does not, you know, it's not going to be germane for every material choice. Um, but I just want to put that consideration out there as we're thinking about this, that, you know, to the extent that we, we definitely want to, uh, get, like I said, serve as that bridge between the past and the future and, and honor the historic choice. But then just wanted to offer those considerations uh, for the long term stewardship of the property. Thank you for bringing up both those points. And I think I'd be inclined to still hold any property accountable to what residents think, especially we've spent so much time discussing windows. However, the second point about um, the unique program and nature of this house, and I realize that uh, modern windows are incredibly operable and they have that longevity, but they're also heavier because you do have a unique um, occupant situation that this has to also be accessible. And I think, to me, that would be enough of a condition that would make this exempt. What well, we should still hold all residents. So I'm particularly on this one. I agree with what Alexander was saying about the accessibility issue for it is given the unique subject, and I think it's an extremely good on this. As I said, um, I, I do believe uh, what Dick was saying in this case. Um, you would want to keep that consistency uh, across all projects, given the uniqueness of Mark, picking the windows. I think uh, if you consider the unique use, it's appropriate to be open to a different option. Secondly, considering the difficult history we've had, them taking possession and utilizing this property will guarantee its savings. Which is the whole reason we purchased Leafland to begin with. I've been really unable to find someone who wants to take it on. That also leans into my you and Bob, window take. 
Oh, Jerry. Um, um, and could be persuaded either way. Um, I think to Dip's point that it is valid if we're holding homeowners to the uh, wood window replacement, but it should also be considered for this property. But given the use, um, understand that argument as well. I would be interested when materials start to be selected to see product sheets of what a wood window would be or what the metal pad window would be. I think I would agree with you on that too. I think I'd be interested to see sort of for the, for the, uh, the occupant there essentially. I mean, sort of like what is a, what are the real actual sort of specs and options and like what's the, you know, lift weights and, and different things. So I'd like to be, it'd be explored at least. I mean, I'm not sort of, I'm not really sort of rigid one or the other, but given that we have really spent a lot of time on windows, historically on the board, I would like to, it, does, it, it should be, it should be addressed or, or at least explored. That's my opinion. I also think, um, given that, we are looking at an addition, and that is primarily where the bedrooms are. It wouldn't be opposed to the addition being aluminum clad and the historic original building be with windows, just as another option. I think that's Having lived with um, 1909 windows uh, for a couple of decades or more, more um, it, when you keep them in good repair, um, they work just fine. And I finally found a company that that does that and they're now I, I don't think it's come out yet but there's a spray material that is I've seen written up that you're supposed to be able to spray on old windows that gives you the same energy efficiency as double glazing there i think there there are options for working with the windows and i i think maybe a hybrid to the historic building as, as opposed to the Do you want to take a, a vote on how everyone feels about the ramp options, the formal kind of direct one for the applicant? That's good. So let's kind of, let's kind of like go around the room on, on different ramp options as well. So my take on the ramp option, I'm, I'm sort of with adoption option two there. It's kind of my take, Joan. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I think I'm adding or, or not deleting uh, the entirety of the stairs um, would be a good thing. Um, I agree with you on option two as well. And I think option two is Alex. Two and like Joan, I think leaving some of the steps. Bob, who? Yeah, no. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what's, what's your view on, on, on the ramp options? I'm not sure which one was option two, but I'm fine with what the applicant had suggested was the best option. Is that, is that number two? Yes, that's number two. Yep. two yep. Okay. Yep. Unanimous. Can we read back the motion? I can read back the motion. See if you want to include it. I move that the HALRB approve a conditional POA for Reusland LHD at 400 North Van Tusker pursuant to their return for a full POA approval when their plans are further. With that, I mean, do we take it as sort of process itself? We'll see different things over the years. We will see this again yeah, um, before it comes back to the full board. Okay. With that, I'm, I'm happy. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, does it? Uh, I just want to make sure that this motion does not give tacit approval to the window proposal. You want to propose an amendment? Uh, sure. I, I'll just say that provided that the issue of uh, aluminum clad windows will be left open to be determined by the board in the future. We need a second. A second. A second. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Lauren, go ahead. Um, I just want to confirm, uh, Serena, because I want to make sure that we show um, 
our other colleagues that need to see that a conditional COA has been approved. Serena, are, can we do something to the plans where we um, kind of X out at least the maybe cross out the window description um, to just kind of reflect that as well? Or do you think that's not necessary? So I can add a note and I usually do that. So I'll drop a note on the page, any pages that have a reference. And Great, I, thank you. And I'll say it's deferring on that issue for further discussion and will not hold up any the what what's hold up any of the timeline in terms of our due diligence and planning. That's something that can be decided later. Right now, what's really critical is knowing that we have to go ahead to move forward with massing and the general plan, so a general concept so that we can start getting the structural engineer, the civil engineer to do the do the heavy analysis. So the windows is that correct me if I'm wrong, Scott. Nope, and, I agree. You know, I agree. Defer, we I can talk about that later. <laughs> yes. Okay, so Andy just confirming you seconded, correct? Yes. Okay. The other Here. discussion on that? Discussion. Defer discussion. Let's all right. Call let's, the let's, call, let's, let's do this. If you support, um, please say yes. Mr. Aiken. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Ms. Foster. Yes. Mr. Laporte. Yes. Ms. Lawrence. Yes. Mr. Medden. Yes. Ms. Meyer. Yes. Mr. Turnbull. Yes. Mr. Wenschel. Yes. Mr. Woodruff. That's unanimous, and if staff could vote, we would too, but we can't. So we lost. <laughs> <laughs> but we will see you here. Thank you very much. We appreciate the feedback from the design review committee. Yeah. Yeah. It's really helpful to get all of your perspectives in the lead up. It's been a great process. So thank you. We'll love the book. to the McIntyre. I really appreciate your time. Uh, so I'm very excited to present 2002 North Stafford Street. Um, we're going to start district application consideration. Mr. and Mrs. McIntyre uh, joined us this for consent application. Um, this is a, a single parcel local historic district. Um, and the zoning overlay would affect only the property at 2002 North Stafford Street. The property is in Cherrydale near the Waverly Hills border and is contributing to the Cherrydale National Register District. Um, it is a circa 1920 freestanding single family craftsman style bungalow uh, with a lot of architectural integrity. The National Register nomination notes its hipped dormer and brick porch columns. The Cherrydale National Register District was designated for its association with community development and architecture of the turn of the 20th century, including the development of residential suburban neighborhoods and its craftsman colonial revival and Tudor revival home. So located on the 1900 Erasmus tract, as you can see, this property is close to one of the main 1900 county thoroughfares, so it would have been in a, an area that got a lot of uh, movement and would have been very attractive. The 1932 Sanborn Fire Insurance map shows that this was one of Arlington's earliest developed neighborhoods with many parcels already developed, while other neighborhoods were still fairly sparsely inhabited and used as farmland. Um, so this is uh, just a rough timeline. I've not done any research. I'm just presenting to you a little bit of information and then the application information from the applicants. So the goal would be for you to analyze whether or not you feel like this property should be added to our research roster. And then I would move forward, do the research, and then present that to you um, at a later date with a designation report and design guidelines and what I would have worked on with the applicants. And so um, circa 1900, Erasmus D. Preston owns the 16 acres here. Um, a first generation Irish immigrant buys three empty lots. He is a carpenter and he builds it himself. Um, probably in two stages around 1920 and 1925. Um, he and his family live here for the duration of his life and two, he got through two wives. So 
the duration of two wives. Um, <laughs> so in 1961, Mary and Dewey Smith buy the home from the Brennans, and then 1972, the home's updated with a one-story addition and renovation. There are a few other updates along the way, um, but it's extremely integral. And in 1984, uh, Joan and Thomas McAtee purchased the home and have been fabulous stewards for this property uh, since then. Uh, so this is the east facade. Um, it faces onto a quiet residential street and is across the street from a large um, Catholic diocese uh, school and location. And so you can see the brick uh, porch columns. It currently has aluminium siding, but you also have shingles underneath, which I believe are still underneath. And uh, that's oh, vinyl, vinyl siding. Oh, it's vinyl siding. Sorry, I I got the note wrong. Apologies, but I will also invite you to, to tell us everything you would like to once. Um, I've just gotten through the lovely photos. So they let me come by on a beautiful sunny day uh, and take photos of the property. Um, this is the rear. The side elevation. And so as you can see, there is um, there are very minor additions. Largely the house has remained as it was. Um, here are a few of the details. So this is the, um, I believe you said it was a Ford car rut. Yeah, the Model T. Model T ruts in the, leading to what used to be a garage, which is on the Sanborn Fire Insurance map. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that this is representative of a typical popular residential style in Arlington in the 1920s. It only had three owners. Um, it's largely integral. And um, we currently only have one other residential local historic district in the Cherryville National Register District. Um, and we have otherwise one other in the neighborhood, which is the Cherrydale Volunteer Firehouse. But otherwise, there are no other protected properties in the Cherrydale National Register District in this entire area. And there's a, a lot of development, because it's a very attractive area, as we said, very close to a number of um, major roads, but not on any of them. So it's a very quiet residential area. Um, the McIntyres also shared some um, history with me that it may be connected to possibly the land was used for a hospital during the Civil War and some other historic facts that I haven't been able to substantiate yet, but I'm only at the beginning of my um, uh, journey into the history. And so, um, Mr. and Mrs. McIntyre, would you like to, to talk to us about your stewardship of the home and, and what you appreciate about it? Yeah, well, I mean, we've lived here for almost 40 years and really uh, appreciate the and the historic nature of it, the early 20th century. Um, we've really worked and we've done renovations and in, in interior. We haven't done much to the exterior, but to actually keep the historic nature of it. It's got the original wood floors, it's got the original um, plaster walls, it's got a lot of um, interesting um, wood um, design, you know, um, rails and, and, and things like that. And we've still got the original. Um, the tin ceiling in the kitchen. Actually, hated to do it, but we did have to get rid of the tin roof at some point. It just kept springing too many leaks. But um, so that that was, and then we took out the bathtub at home. It was too hard to renovate, but it's still in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and reusing that. So you know, you know, I'd like to make sure that this house. Actually, I'm really hoping that some of the other neighbors that are nearby, we've got a cluster of houses that are about the same age. And there does seem to be a little bit of interest among the neighbors of considering historic designations. Spread within the neighborhoods. Preserve some of this kind of cluster of architecture. It's a beautiful neighborhood to visit. I highly recommend it. It really feels when you drive through it and walk around it, it's extremely pedestrian friendly, um, gives you the scale that is what we um, are used to in Arlington and really reminds you of um, the era in which Arlington began to, to develop as a residential neighborhood and why it was so attractive to so many people. I think that, um, I think that probably one of the more unusual aspects of this house is it's a century old, it's only had three owners. Uh, people, people tend to move in and like it. What's also interesting about the houses adjacent to it is that four or five, maybe six of our neighbors have lived there nearly as long as we have, nearly 40 years, or, or some in some cases longer. 
So this is a very, I think that's pretty unique in a world where when we bought the house, the real estate agent said, oh, well, every seven years. Um, can you show the slide with the north side again? We're seeing a little bit of it. First, um, yeah, you see all that green slime back there? I spent most of the last weekend scrubbing that off, but if anybody has a, a tip as to how to keep that from coming back. <laughs> that is fine. We, we had to replace the aluminum siding about 15 to 20 years ago. But it was aluminum. It's, the original siding are cedar shakes, which are still there. The last owners had it covered with aluminum siding, which then that doesn't hold up uh, all that well. I think the cedar shingles were pretty thick, but we didn't get them. Unfortunately, north sides often suffer from this um, kind of niching problem, and so unless we Tilt the earth slightly differently. <laughs> <laughs> or chop okay. down all the adjacent. It's really not you, yes. Um, I would also note, um, as you mentioned about the neighbors, um, we as a program are trying to uh, delve more into cultural history. And so um, the learning more about Mr. Brennan and his roots as a recent immigrant to this country, and then his work as a carpenter and the, the working class roots of a lot of early Arlington, um, I think is going to be a really valuable addition to the, the narrative that we're building. There, there's clear evidence that the, the original owner built it himself because we have one or two closets where there's sort of fancy molding on the inside of the <laughs> closet. He just had left over, whatever he had left over from the site. Mm -hmm. And then the ceilings uh, are, um, we have one ceiling that's quite unusual, which is a very, very heavily done uh, swirl pack. But nothing like you could find it. Right, it is not too expensive. Is that the plaster? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the original. Yeah. So he left his mark. <laughs> no, he, it really is uh, a little bit unique. Kind of weird thing. But... <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, after three different to check to see what the original roof material was. Um, it should, is that an open circle? Or a small for me? It was 10. We could probably dig out. We may have some pictures. Back at that. I'm sure we do somewhere. Yeah, it was galvanized steel, the old stuff. But yeah. it's the underlayments that they used in those days. Okay, so eventually it as you can see, this 1932 map, um, it looks, it's a, uh, it indicates it's a wood frame house with a, a fire resistant roof, so it makes sense. There's the outdoor. Yes, and there's the little garage that we still have the ruts to, but the, the structure is still standing. Are there any questions from the commission? I think it's great that you want to have it designated and preserve it. There's just every time I drive down another street in Cherrydale, there's just another house that's. So you can see the house on the left, an older house. Yeah. Of yeah. course, the house on the other side yeah. isn't the same. I think it's a little older. Than the one on the left looks very much like one of the neighbors where I live. That's 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 there's one house in our territory. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to commend the McIntyres for doing this. It's so great, you know, with all the teardowns in Cherrydale that you're, you know, coming forward to protect this house. I'm a homeowner in Maywood, and I know the advantages of having an historic district um, or a group of houses. And if you need any assistance in trying to persuade your neighbors of the advantages of of making that an historic house and I'm happy to volunteer um, and make the case on how it's benefited Maywood, where we've had almost no teardowns at all um, in the last 20 years, I think maybe one or two. And it's been, it's been because they have this historic preservation protection. So 
you know, if there's a way I can help you persuade your neighbors, please call on me. I think I, two of our neighbors are on on the Zoom part of this meeting, at least tonight. That's great. That's great. And again, thank you for doing this. Your comments, questions? Hearing none, we'll move to the motion. So. So I moved at the at the HLRB, add the parcel at 202, sorry, 2002 North Stafford Street, the Historic Preservation Program staff queue for research for consideration at the local historic district. I'll second that. That's all the rules. recommended some edits to the images to balance out uh, the representation that we were providing because he was right a little bit uh, lopsided and then um, adding important information her birth and death date um, clearing up certain references uh, returning information about her education um, and yes just generally making it more accessible and more legible um, I, and I think you all know because I mentioned this before, this comes with the support of it was proposed by um, one of our sisters at the Alpha Kappa Authority, and it still comes with her support. And I worked with her sons, um, Craig and um, Archie Sidebex, Chief Doug Sidebex, um, on this. I don't know. Okay. I looked at the final version just before this afternoon, and I still have some edits. And I think it has to do with, and I don't know if that, I don't want to go through. We can go I, through. I mean, um, I, think, I, think I mean, we, I mean, all I can give you, if, unless there's something. Uh, no, I mean, I think they're all just kind of stylistic, and, you know, some things. Added it and put it back in, yeah. and now it's duplicated and replaced. And so the one actual thing I don't really know. You talk about the Hoffman Boston Elementary School, and you say that's in Penrose. So I think of that being probably in Scottish. Okay. We can confirm that. That's an actual thing that yes. didn't come up before. Okay. Other people may be more familiar with that neighborhood and think of that, even though technically it's not in Penrose, everybody calls it Penrose, so this is okay. I just don't know that much about the neighborhoods. No, you're right. And I will check. I just wanted to give it a little bit of context since it's going to be nearby. And I want people to think, oh, I'm here. I'm standing, you know, by the, the APS building um, that the Hoffman was. But yes, I will confirm. Yeah. I don't know if you want me to. I can send these things to you. I can read them. I don't want to go through. You know, 
and more people. But oh, I mean, I definitely want to hear if it's something that you think uh, would um, means that it needs to be reviewed in other months. Yeah, one of the things I think that I had suggestion I had made and that you didn't accept talked about three Blues Village as being a community of emancipated Africans. They weren't emancipated when we started because the emancipation proclamation didn't come until later. I had made that, you didn't accept that, but I don't think you realized that was me. Actually, they were okay. freed slaves, but they weren't emancipated. Okay. Because emancipation is, I think, a technical term, something that happened as a result of it. Like DC just uh, celebrated its Emancipation Day because it's the law that was passed. Right. So you're thinking more capital E emancipation than just emancipation, meaning the definition of free. Yes, they're not synonyms. Okay. I don't. I, I don't think in American history we use these. Terms. Okay. So. I see. So what I'd like to suggest, maybe, if you could give us copy of your edits like we've worked on in the past and then as we're working to finalize if we have further questions jerry we can contact you directly sure. um, if, if that if that's, that's okay fine. i don't know if other members had other editorial comments or design comments they wanted to express i think the layout has been right i didn't catch the emancipation of the country it was part of it but um yeah, there, there aren't any other changes though. Anyone else? And if you've got anything or after this, you can also send it to me because we, we won't um, edit it for a while. So if you want to, if you happen to be looking at it for the first time right now, because maybe you don't open my emails as soon as I send them <laughs> on Wednesdays when you're so excited, then I would understand if you wanted to. I would add the justification on some of the on some of the text gets a little bit squishy, kind of wonky, and so. That's so little... I tried to. Uh, if you don't like justify it, it like all leans over to one side and looks yeah. bad. But then when you do, it does this bizarro spacing thing. Yeah. And so then sometimes I have to go back through and change, and like. But yes, I yeah. will now that you're like now that I have it full size. I'm going to. Make it not seem like I forgot the space between. Yeah, that was. Yeah, yeah. Is the hand sign maker change that, or do, does they do they take? Are you working with a program that you're going to within send a to program them? that we will send to them, and they'll send and they'll, us the proof. They'll do it the exact. They're not going to change. They're the not going to manipulate. Oh, the okay, so you have yeah. to get it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I it's agree. ridiculous. Sorry, for Serena. <laughs> <laughs> I say that's too bad. Right yeah. in this in it, that's on our end to fix. Which is great because sometimes uh, there were spellers. You know, so then you end up with <laughs> how you end up with signs. Like there's one um, on the way to Maywood, there's a bus that says free appraisals on the side and it has only one P. I try to speak. <laughs> I think about it twice a week. <laughs> <laughs> At least, yes. Okay, this might just be a printer thing. Um, in the communities, I just uh, the print we so we printed for all of you. Um, don't give away the surprise. I was just saying we used a lot of ink today yeah. in the printer, so it's probably an in a printer <laughs> and error. Okay. Yeah. Surprise! And this <laughs> and the printer was struggling toward the end. Yes, and we will get a color sample. So when we send this for production, they send us um, a color sample. So we I will confirm that uh, it's going to be. Yeah, we can spot check that. What's the timing on that? Uh, I mean, I would like to get it in the ground. We would like to year. order it before the end of the fiscal year. So as soon as we could get it approved, the better then we can finesse and finalize and, and get a purchase order. But we can, I mean, there's no uh, event that this is happening okay. for. So I'm, I'm not, uh, if there are changes that need to happen, I don't want to um, sacrifice quality for. But in the fiscal year, that means you basically, ideally within the next two meetings, we catch a lot of first deadline. Within the next, we would need to have it ready to be ordered by the middle of June. So the next meeting. Is and also, yeah. you are receiving another, hope, maybe receiving another marker the next week. Thanks. So the text on the side here, um, 
could be really small. Is there any way you guys can? So um, it, you if you see it full size, size. Uh, and any more of yes, but if you check it and it's still not legible, then yes. No, um, it's probably legible by one. Yes, it is standard on the markets, but I can absolutely, like if you say this is not okay. Then it's going to be tabletop or um, vertical? It will be table tabletop. Slanted table. Tabletop, so yeah. about two feet. Um, yes, wheelchair accessible height. Yes, so I think the standard is. That affects. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Um, anything else? Okay. Um. Just about done. Yeah. So let's let's try out the motion that I that I had previously and see if it makes sense. Oh, all right. So I move that the HLRB approve the Evelyn Reed side effects marker, including. Any outstanding minor text or design edits? That's used in stone or not for anybody? Or again, it's any outstanding minor text or design edits? You can qualify what we discussed here today, but no comments. Any seconds? seconds? That lets us take the roll. Okay, Mr. Aiken. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Ms. Foster. Yes. Uh, Mr. Laporte. Yes. Ms. Lawrence. Yes. Mr. Medish. Take me to it. <laughs> Mr. Meyer. Ms. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Meyer. Yes. Uh, Mr. Trimble. Yes. Mr. Wenchel. Yes. And Mr. Woodruff. Yes. Animus. So we'll work with you, Jerry, on your your additional edits. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You break it up in four chunks, really. So with that, the chairman's report, and I'm going to defer the chair's report today just to Jerry to discuss the Wakefield matter um, review. Yeah, I went to the um, okay. plan review <laughs> committee meeting uh, for Wakefield, the new development, Wakefield Manor, which has been approved was approved like 10 years ago or something you know, a long time ago but we worked very very hard to get a um another building to be built on that site that would be uh, compatible with the historic wakefield manor and uh the developer that um we worked with at that did such a good job fitting it in sold the Property to some other developer who, of course, says it's unbuildable. Okay, and um, it probably means they paid too much for the property. Okay, <laughs> I'll be too cynical here. But so they have proposed a what they call a redesign, but it's really a totally different building. Don't we have to approve it? Um, I don't know the answer to that. It's Laura Disnorton. Hi. Thank you, Jerry, for going to that meeting. And technically, the HLRB does not have any review authority over the design of the property um, that is uncovered in the easement um, as a requirement. Um, the most we can do is attempt to influence the design by comments that I'm able to provide the project team and the um, applicant, as well as Jerry's influence at the SPRC meetings. But we're trying our best to try and make adjustments so that it's as sensitive as possible to Wakefield Manor and Courthouse Manor. Yeah, let me say that um, there were, you know, people from other commissions who also expressed Surprise! Like there was, it's supposed, I don't know if you remember the old plan. There was a lot of open space. It's, it's supposed to be garden apartments. Okay, so part of the plan was to have a lot of open space. Well, they've taken like what used to be open space and they put a garage underneath it and um, put the, like a patio area with um, grills that is only going to be open. It's like one story high and it's only going to be open to people who live in the building. Okay, so that's and they want to. Uh, Qualify as open space. I think that's that's not going to 
that's not going to go, okay, just because people, and another big deal, they they dropped, I don't know if you remember the, the roof line, they had put a roof line on it that sort of devoked the, the um, Wakefield Manor. Well, they've gotten rid of that. They put a flat roof on, and they want to put a swimming pool, and a, what's, what's, what sells now? In the piers, you know, the rooftop swimming pool is huge. Okay, so it's a, a flat top building like the Pierce and all the other buildings that are being built along Wilson Boulevard in Boston. Is what they want to put. So uh, I think, um, you know, I've, I've, they got some pushback from other commissioners, including me. And uh, Sarah Steinberger, I think, is now the West Chair of the Planning Commission. So I'm not sure when the Planning Planning Commission has to approve this. So I presume that we will want to be appearing for the Planning Commission to try to um, uh, affect what they decide. And then um, it may be that we um, will be sending, I'll be recommending that we send a letter to the County Board, depending on what comes out of the Planning Commission as to whether the County Board should approve the design in whatever form. We have another meeting on the uh, May the 15th, so they, they, they will probably come back with some designs, and I don't know, but there were, there were other people who also so shared views that I expressed that didn't really, to um, me at least, uh, look like anything like. And the, but one thing they did, they, some of the brickwork um, in Wakefield Man, and they tried to replicate that in terms of the brickwork to build it. So it is a brick building. Uh, but it's sort of subtle, you almost can't notice it unless they point it out to you. Uh, and uh, that may um, that might not survive either because some of the other people said that um, it's too complicated. So um, I don't know. Uh, and but they said they put it in there because it, you know, you know, it looks like the brick wall. Yeah, so um, maybe that was anyway. So we'll see where it goes. Any questions? Thanks for, thanks for the update to keep us abreast of that. Yeah, um, we'll definitely look at. We'll definitely do a letter. I think. I mean, that's, you know, things change drastically. Um, yeah, I probably should have gotten the slides and sent them to you because they did show us slides, and I thought oh, I should. Have, then it wasn't until this afternoon. It should be on the website, though. The yeah, they should be on the website yeah. if you're interested in looking at the slides. They are on the website. I think you could, I think, just one look at it. Will, I think you'll agree with most everything I said. Just a reference. Is there any way to see what was proposed previously? Like, I guess now. The oh, they show ago. pictures of what was proposed oh. and what was proposed now. It's um, evolved. Oh, it's very, very different. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you for participating in that. Yeah. Any other chair report? That's no, no chair report today. Okay. We'll just um, dive into the staff. We've got a quick staff report. So we are pleased to announce, if you saw Michael's email this afternoon, if you subscribe to our newsletter, we have our draft planning document that was released to the public today. It's no longer called the Historic Preservation Master Plan. We have rebranded and renamed to be the Historic and Cultural Resources Plan. So we printed out copies for all of you here today. If you would like to take your time and start reading through it and um, coming up with your comments, questions, suggestions. And a reminder to everybody, we have a week from today, a special meeting for the HLRB all about the plan. So this is going to be your opportunity to get an overview um, direct from our consultant who is coming in um, for this meeting. We can take as long or as little time as you all want to discuss it. Just know that this is not going to be your only opportunity to sit with the plan. We will bring this back to you in a final form, most likely in August. But we wanted to make sure that you as our Preservation Commission had some time with it. So. We were hoping we were going to have it a little bit earlier, but we got it out today. Um, and for those of you who are not here this evening, we will send you copies so you can have paper copies if you'd like. Also on the website, I would direct you to, if you want to look at it digitally, 
just search historic preservation on the county website. It should get you to our homepage directly. There's all sorts of additional information on there. We have a summary of the plan in case you don't want to start by reading the whole thing. We have a video recording that also provides a summary starring our one and only Michael. Um, we also have an online feedback uh, opportunity that also went live today that is going to be available until June 20th. So please feel free to give us your feedback through that uh, comment opportunity. You can share the links to the plan. You can share the feedback questions with your friends, your neighbors, your family. We really would appreciate any help that you can offer to kind of help spread the word about the draft. Um, and I will pass these out as Michael gives you a quick update about the next big thing that's happening in the planning process on May 6th. The last time you'll hear me talk about our big event coming up because it's happening May 6th, so the week before um, our May HBLIB meeting. Um, a special meeting. The network, yeah, the ABL mentioned that's coming up next. Um, it's our open house event. Uh, it's on Saturday, May 6th from 12 to 3. Uh, thank you again to those of you who have signed me up to volunteer. If there are others who are interested, let me know. Uh, we have plenty of room um, and opportunities in need uh, for the extra hands um, on deck that day. Um, again, it's happening at the uh, Central Library Auditorium, and Serena uh, shared the flyer that we have about the event. So if you don't mind sharing that with anybody and everybody, just to really help promote it, it's open to the entire community, and we would love to have a really solid turnout. It's one of the um, many ways that people can learn about the plan, but also direct uh, or um, engage directly with us and then provide their feedback in real time. So we would greatly appreciate that. Um, and the other thing that we have coming up are a lot of pop up events. So um, we are going to uh, a bunch of different locations across the county, but we'll be at farmers markets. We're going to be at the Columbia uh, Pike Blues Festival. Um, we are going to be at the Earth Day celebration um on Langston Boulevard this Sunday Lauren's going to be staffing that one so come say hi and if you have any interest in helping out with any of those feel free to reach out and um, I'll, I'll get you signed up or something any questions for us um do you have a list of the pop-ups and when they are um I can I can talk to you about that, the different dates and opportunities yeah um I can uh, connect with you on This was a long meeting. That's all we had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bob. Um, uh, we adjourn, uh, Mr. Chair? Yeah, we're, we're adjourned. Oh, wait. I just want to my uh, disappointment. Oh, uh, not yet. No.